welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. If you've got your Bibles tonight, just in the next few moments that we're going to be together, I'd like to bring a word to you, and it's actually called Pawns or Players. Because I do believe in the Word of God, and I know it's only the Word that has the power to change and to save our souls. It's nothing else. It's how I went from being an ex-druggie and an ex-everything else way back in the dark ages of my life to being who I am today, which is a nana, a mom, a wife, a pastor's wife, and who's had the privilege of traveling the earth and seeing so many, many, many things in the kingdom of God. Now that we're in our 60s and we're, we're the, actually the seniors now, it's, it's wonderful to be able to look back and see how faithful God is. And it is the word that has the power to change us. It is the word of God that is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is the word that is relevant in the 21st century as it was relevant when it was written. It is the word that says what was happening in the book of Acts in that early church, in that first century in Rome, in a, in a pagan world, in a world that we, if we were transported into time, would not know how to live in that world, in that world where there were amazing signs, wonders, and miracles. That same God lives today in our world and wants to show himself strong to us. But it is the living and the breathing word of God that has the power to bring itself to pass that changes us. And so tonight I want to look at just a, a horrible story, a tragedy actually. And I want to look at how God put this in the word of God and use this person and what happened to this person in my life in the 21st century. This person probably lived about 3,500 years ago. That's a long time ago. And that's in a world and a culture that I would not understand. But yet this person is in the word of God to teach me so that I can grow and I can be the woman of God and the child of God that I need to be in my world today in the 21st century. So I want you to go with me to the book of 2 Samuel. I want to look at a woman tonight who's little known, and some of you girls have heard me teach on Rizpah, but I want to talk about Rizpah tonight and, and just this, this incident that happened in her life. She is an unknown. She was a concubine of Saul, and a concubine was a legal mistress. Saul was king of Israel, and he had wives, and Rizpah was a concubine, and she had two sons by King Saul. Now, if you were a concubine, you weren't legally married, but your sons were legal heirs, and they received the inheritance. So I would term a concubine in today's vernacular as a legal mistress. There was polygamy. There was multiple wives, so she wasn't a wife, but she was a concubine. And this Rizpah didn't really have any rights of her own. She was Saul's concubine when Saul was killed and Jonathan was killed and David became king. She was thrown into a poverty and into everything else, and her life was where it was. She had two growing sons, and there's an incident that happens. And David is king, and he is on the throne, and there's been a drought in Israel for three years. Now, remember, this is an agrarian culture. It is a farming culture. There are not sprinkler systems and electricity. So you grow crops by the latter rains and the early rains. And so when it doesn't rain, there is no crops. And when there are no crops, there, are no, there is no food. There's no food to feed your beasts. There's no food to feed your cattle, your donkeys, your oxen. There's no food to feed your family. You begin to starve because everything revolved around farming. Now, we don't live in that world, but that's the world that she was living in. And so when there was a drought... And it wasn't just a drought for one season. It was a drought for three seasons, three years. David is king now of Israel, seeks the Lord, and he prays, and he says, God, why is there something happening in our land that isn't being fixed by you as we seek you? Now, I can draw an awful lot of allusions to this in my own nation, and I would be here for hours. But let's just look at this in 2 Samuel, in the 21st chapter of 2 Samuel. David inquires of the Lord in chapter 21. God answers David in verse 21. It says, there was a famine in the land in the days of David for three years. And David inquired of the Lord. And the Lord answered. And he said, because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. So the king called the Gibeonites and spoke to them. And the Gibeonites were not the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. 
The children of Israel had sworn protection to them, but Saul had sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. So when Saul became king, he took the Gibeonites who lived in the territories of Israel, and he slaughtered them. And because of this, there was a drought on the land because there was sin in the land. And even though it was years later, that sin had not been atoned for. It had not, you, you know, and, and the point is you can't take unatoned for, unrepented sin and sweep it under the rug and expect that it's not going to come back to bite you. There is no such thing as no consequence. Now, we are Christians, and as we repent of sin, and as we ask God for forgiveness, the blood of Jesus washes us, and that sin is as far removed from us as the east is from the west. But if we are dabbling in sin and we're not repenting of it, if there are things happening that, that are being swept under, that are not being looked at, that are not being dealt with, that sin remains, and God can do nothing about it until we repent and let the blood wash us. Are you with me? So here's Israel, and they're in this mess because of Saul. So David calls the Gibeonites, and he says, well, what do you want me to do? And the Gibeonites say to him, we want you to do what you think is right because we don't have authority to do anything. But this is what we would like you to do for us. We'd like you to take seven of Saul's sons, and we'd like you to deliver them to us, and we want blood for blood, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And we will destroy them because they have slaughtered us. And then the land will be atoned for. Now, that seems like a horrible thing. But you see, the reason that that could be was because you have to go all the way back to the book of Joshua in chapter 9. And let me just tell you what happened there. And that is that the Gibeonites were not Israelites. They were Amorites. And they tricked Israel when Israel had come into the promised land. And they had told Israel that they were far, far away and that they had come from a far land to make a covenant with Israel in Joshua chapter 9. Now, I want you to go there with me. These are not on the overheads, but if I don't explain this, the brief lesson that I'm going to teach tonight is not going to make any sense. Is that all right? God's a God of covenant. New Testament, Old Testament, the word testament is a, is, is a Latin transliteration for te testamentum, which means covenant, blood covenant. It means the strongest agreement that can be made on the planet or in the universe. It means that you and I make an agreement and we cut it in blood. That blood is shed and as we walk through that blood and as we say to each other, so be it unto you and so be it unto me. If we break this promise, if we break this covenant, this blood be on us. Let us be as dead as this animal that we have slaughtered for this blood covenant. It is a solemn, binding promise when it is blood covenant. Now in Joshua chapter 9, Joshua makes a blood covenant with the Gibeonites. He says to them that we will not kill you and we will not harm you. So that blood covenant goes all the way through to Saul's day. Are you with me? God honors covenant. That's why he honors marriage. When you and I stand before God and we get married and we make our vows, God says, I am present at that blood. Marriage is a blood covenant. I'm present there. That's why he hates divorce. God wants us to keep our promises. Our yes is yes and our no is no. And so Joshua, because Joshua had not sought the Lord, was tricked by the Gibeonites. And in Joshua chapter 9... When the Gibeonites had lied to them and said they were from a far off country, and Joshua believed them and didn't seek the Lord, in verse 14 it says, And the men of Israel took some of their provision, but they did not ask counsel of the Lord, and they made a blood covenant with them. When they find out that they only live six miles away, because Gibeon is only six miles from Jerusalem, then they wail before God and they, and they cry and they say, Oh God, we've made this wrong covenant. Well, too late. Your yes is yes and your no is no. You cut the covenant with these people. Now you're going to have to live with it. Why? Because they brought God's name into it. If you look at Joshua chapter 9, in verse 18, but the children of Israel did not attack them because the rulers of the congregation had sworn to them, talking about the Gibeonites, by the Lord God of Israel... And all the congregation of Israel complained. So they made this blood covenant with these Gibeonites by the Lord God. They swore in the name of God. 
They had bound God to this promise. Now God's in the mix. Now God's name's at stake. So here comes Saul hundreds of years later in his zeal to atone and to make Israel a nation. He's the first king of Israel. They rejected God as king and they have Saul as king. Saul then slaughters the Gibeonites. He destroys them. Now David destroyed people and there wasn't a drought on the land. This was happening because there had been a blood covenant and it had been broken. Are you with me? And so God tells David, you're going to have to be responsible if you want your land healed. If you want your land healed, you're going to be responsible for what Saul has done because the land is suffering under the sin of Saul. The point is, is that leaders and their sin can bring an entire nation under judgment. Hear what I am saying, America. Leaders because of their unrighteousness, can lead an entire nation under the judgment of God, and God can do nothing until it is repented of and dealt with. You wonder why we're in a recession? You wonder why we're not getting out of this? Could it be America? Could it be that we are under the judgment of heaven because we have not repented? Could it be that America and the world is coming under the judgment of God and the day of the Lord is at hand and Jesus is coming and there will be a judgment and there will be an answer and a quickening that everything in this book is true and real and it will come to pass? If it can happen to Israel, it can happen to us. So Rizpah is the concubine. So the Gibeonites say, give us seven men. And it's blood for blood. And Rizpah has not one thing to say about this. She is a concubine. Her husband, her crazy husband is dead. And they take her two sons and they take five of Saul's grandsons and they crucify them and they kill them and they impale them on stakes. And Rizpah cannot do one thing about it. And the title of tonight's message is Pawns or Players. When bad things happen, that you can do nothing about, that you didn't cause and you didn't make happen, but you are living it and you are born into it and it is facing you. My question and my title of this, are we going to be pawns like on a chessboard and just victims or are we going to be the players that God wants us to be in the kingdom of God and change the circumstances and bring the kingdom of God to the worst possible scenario? Are you hearing what I'm saying? So Rizpah is there with her boys, and they kill her boys. And in 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 8 says, So the king took Armani and Mephibosheth, now that's not the Mephibosheth of Jonathan, the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, that she bore to Saul, and the five sons of Michal, the daughter of Saul, and they delivered them into the Gibeonites, and they hanged them on the hill before the Lord. So they fell all seven together and were put to death in the days of the harvest. In the first days in the beginning of the barley harvest, verse 9. This is important because this is in the days of the barley harvest. It's probably around May. Now we're going to see this woman do something from May probably to October, five months. Now there's a drought and people are dying and it's because of what Saul did. So David goes to the Gibeonites. They have bloodthirst. They take these seven men. They kill them. And here is Rizpah, this mother, this concubine, a nobody and a nothing who has no rights, who can't say one thing about what's happened, a classic victim, and she watches her boys and her nephews die before her. And it says in verse 10, Now Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of the harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. So we see the drought's broken. And she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. And David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Ahab, the concubine of Saul, had done. Now, this is a gruesome story. But she did three things tonight. Three things that turned her life from being a classic victim to being victorious and turning a nation, a king, and God. When you can't do anything about what happens to you, 
you can do everything about how you respond to what happens. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I can't control what happens to me, but I can control how I respond to that event. Life is unfair. Life is a mess. And life can be cruel beyond cruel. And it doesn't make sense. And you can say, why God? How come God? Why did this happen, God? Why did my sons have to die because Saul sinned? Why did our nation have to go into this horrific drought that's killing people because of what Saul had done? Why, God, did it have to meet my boys? Why, God, do I have to be married to this person? Why, God, was I born this way? Why, God, did I lose my job? Why, God, did this happen? Why, God, did that happen? Why, God, why, God, why, God, why, God? And I'm here to tell you tonight, Jesus said, in the world you will have trouble. But be of good cheer. Because I have overcome the world. And I'm going to show you tonight that in the midst of that trouble, God is actually chasing us, as C.S. Lewis said, out of the nursery into maturity. Because God's not after our comfort. He is after our growing up. He needs to bring the kingdom of God to us and through us. And Jesus said, tribulation's going to come. Trouble's coming. But be of good cheer. Because it's not what comes at you. It's how you respond and you react and what you do to the trouble that comes at you. She chose to do something. And so the first thing, the three things I'm going to talk about tonight, number one, when trouble comes at me, when it's no fault of my own and there's nothing I can do about it, Rispa shows me that she did, number one, she stood her ground and she stayed in her spot. She stood her ground. What do I mean by that, she stood her ground? It says here, now Rizba, verse 10, a daughter of Aya took sackcloth and spread it for herself on the rock from the beginning of harvest until the late rains poured on them from heaven. She did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. When her boys were crucified in front of her and they died, she took sackcloth and she spread it out on this rock and she stayed there. Now, I don't know about you, but when trouble comes at me, the first thing I want to do is run and get out of the discomfort and find some peace and go somewhere else. I want to find relief from the trouble. I don't want to look at it in the face. I don't want to stand there. I want to run. And yet, Rizpah stood her ground and she stayed in her spot. Sometimes where our spot is, where we're called to, what God is requiring of us at this moment in our lives in this season may not be where we want to be, but it's where God's put us. If all the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord, then where I am, God knows where I am. God knows what's happening to me. He says he'll never leave me or forsake me. And he says if you'll stand up and not lay down, but stand up and stay put, you'll watch the salvation of God because we'll want to run she chose to not be a nothing by choosing to do something she stayed in her spot and she stood her ground not passive resignation but passionate resistance God has not called me to be passive and just resigned it is what it is I guess I'm just going to look at my boys and someday they'll get a decent burial because they didn't take their bodies down. They let their bodies hang there. There was no burial for them. There was no closure. You see, the Gibeonites hung them up and they were rotting on those stakes. And it says that she spread out her sackcloth. Man, something happened in that woman's mind. Something happened in her heart. Something went tilt. This isn't right. Even though it's wrong and even though I can't do anything about their lives because they are dead, I can do something about their death. And she stood up in church. Sometimes it's time for you and I to just stand up. Number two, she stood her ground. She stayed in her spot, number one. Number two, she took courage. What do I mean by that? It says, 2 Samuel 21.10, she did not allow the birds of the air to rest on them by day, nor the beasts of the field by night. Think about this for just a minute. Here is this woman, crazed. She has no place to live. She is out in the open. 
She doesn't have food. Probably people brought her food. Probably people said, Rizpah, you got you to gotta get over this. You got to move on. You got to bring closure to this. Rizpah, you've cracked. You've gone too far. You are not sound. You have gone insane. Because there she was during the day waving off the vultures and the birds of prey. Because these were corpses now. And, they were, and the carrion wanted to eat them. That's what nature does with dead bodies. Have you ever wondered why we don't see thousands of dead birds and dead creatures all over? You ever wondered that? God has a trash system. Hello. Crows and the unclean birds eat the dead. It's God's ecological system. There were birds of prey that wanted to pick them to the bone. And every day for five months from the barley harvest until the rain came, which was October, five months this woman sat on that rock by herself and she waved off the birds of the prey during the day. And it says at night the wild beasts of the field. Now we already know that David killed the lion and the bear. So we know there's wild beasts. Come on somebody. Here is a widow, a concubine, a nobody, a classic victim. And she is on a rock by herself. And she is waving off the wild beasts from tearing those boys apart. Those men apart. Impaled on those stakes. By herself. Now, I don't know about you, but God thought enough about it to put it in the Bible. You know, there's something about courage. We are not made strong by the difficulties we face. Let me read this to you, unknown source. We are, we are made strong by the difficulties we face, not by those we evade. Here's what uh, Mark Twain says. It's not the size of the dog in the fight. It's the size of the fight in the dog, talking about courage. Courage, the quality of being brave, the ability to face danger, the quality of being brave, men and women. This isn't just a macho man thing. This is men and women. It's standing up to face the danger that is very, very real. The birds of the air during the day and the wild beasts at night. The quality of being brave, courage, the ability to face danger, difficulty, uncertainty, or pain without being overcome by fear or being deflected from a chosen course of action. God says that you and I are to take a lesson from this concubine and take courage. That when the trouble comes and you didn't ask for it, you didn't bring it, you didn't choose it. Number one, you stand up and stay put. God has not left you. And number two, like Rizpah, as horrible as it is, you take courage. It takes courage to act alone and not join the crowd. It takes courage to stand up when everybody else sits down. It takes courage to speak up when everybody else is silent. It takes courage to defend the powerless when everyone else wants to side with the powerful. It takes courage to do the right thing when you know it can cost you everything. It takes courage to live your convictions and not give in to the power of compromise. That all takes courage. It takes courage to live a life for Jesus Christ. It takes courage to stand up and to stay put in the kingdom of God. It takes courage to look at injustice and be frustrated and be hurt and heartbroken with it, but to stand up and say, I refuse to be a pawn. I am not going to be a victim. I am going to be a player in the kingdom of God, and God is with me, and if God be for me, who can be against me? And if I have to stay on this rock for five months, I'm staying, and I'm not going to be afraid of the wild beasts at night or the vultures during the day. Courage. What's facing you? Is it the roar of the enemy that you're not going to make it? You're going to lose your job? Maybe you've already lost your house? How about a marriage that's failing and you want to bail on it because you just don't love each other anymore? It takes courage to stay when you want to go. And sometimes it takes courage to leave when everybody else says you should stay. Courage. She took courage. I look at this woman and I say, God, 
if that was me, would I have had the courage to do that? Would I have finally had it with injustice and said, that's enough? I'm drawing a line in the sand. You can think I'm nuts, and you can think I'm crazy. She didn't have a bath. She didn't have a comb for her hair. How did she eat? Probably people brought her food or she wouldn't have survived. How would you like to stay on a rock for five months by yourself and look at the corpses of seven men that you love? And because they desire and they deserve the honor of a burial, you're not going to stop until somebody pays attention to the injustice that's been done. It takes courage to do that. And I believe God's saying to the church, will you stand up and stay in your spot as a church? And will you take courage to stand up against the injustice that is all around you? The intimidation of being a believer and what's politically correct. What's right. Because in this world I'm living in right now, right is wrong and wrong is right. And it's going to take courage to stand up in the love of God and speak the truth and love and not be intimidated by the voices and the choices that are all around me. <laughs> courage. And number three, we're going to end with this. Never thought I could just preach 20 minutes, did you? Can I just read you one more quote on courage? This is Billy Graham. I just love this. Believers, look up. Take courage. The angels are nearer than you think. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It's the courage to continue that counts. Winston Churchill. Courage is to take, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. Winston Churchill. Number three. She refused to quit. Stubborn, tenacious, audacious, in your face faithfulness and devotion to the cause in her heart. Because it says in 2 Samuel 21 11, and David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, the concubine of Saul, had done. So all the way from where these men were tortured and killed and hanging up, all the way to Jerusalem, the word got to David the king. And David was told what Rizpah, the concubine, had done. You see, nobody knew Rizpah. She was a nobody except a concubine of Saul. Now she was old. Her beauty was gone. Her sons are dead. She has nothing that anybody would want. She has nothing. And yet she stayed on that rock for five months. Now, the rains hadn't come yet. Now, wait. God said that the drought was there because the Gibeonites had been slaughtered. Well, it was bloodthirst for bloodthirst. Okay, so now we've... We've killed Saul's seven sons, so why aren't the rains there? See, the rains still hadn't come yet. Why? How come they didn't come instantly when those men were killed? Something was still wrong. There was still injustice. And God could not release the rain until something happened. Are you, with, are you hearing me? See, you wonder why our prayers aren't answered sometimes. There's reasons why. There are things that are happening that have to be dealt with before God can release what he has to release because it's not that he doesn't want to. It's just that we are binding up our own blessing. Our nation, our families, by our activities and our choices. Don't think that our meltdowns and our undealt with sin doesn't have ramification over generations because it does. God is calling this church and his church to holiness, which means purity, which means we deal with the dirt in our lives. God already knows it. We deal with it. We let the blood cleanse it, and we don't go back to it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So now, third point. Second Samuel chapter 21, let's go back there. And David was told what Rizpah, the daughter of Ea, the concubine of Saul, had done, verse 12. Then David went and took the bones of Saul... And the bones of Jonathan, his son. Now Saul and Jonathan, Jonathan was Saul's son, the king, Saul the king, 
had been killed. He'd been dismembered. And the men from Jabesh Gilead had come and stolen his bones and they had buried him in honor because Saul had fought for them. But he wasn't buried in his tribal lands. He was a Benjamite. He was in foreign soil in another tribe. There was no honor in his burial. God's a God of honor and God is a God of respect and God is a God of promise and authority. So David hears what Rizpah's done, and he gets convicted in his heart. Her actions moved a king, a brave king, a warrior king, a king that was so strong and so loved by God that David slew his 10,000. The giant killer didn't have the guts to go get the bones of Saul and Jonathan and bury them where they were supposed to be buried. Why didn't King David take the bones and take those men down off of that stake? Because the law of God said that you're not to leave somebody overnight. You're to bury them and... Let it be done. But you see, David didn't do that. And there was no rain. And Rizpah didn't quit. She didn't get off that rock. Her boys were already dead. But there was day and night and day and night and month after month. One month, two months, three months, four months. How many days are in five months? Five times 30 is what? 150 days from the time of the barley harvest to the time of the latter rain? That's five months. That woman stood there and did what she did because she refused to quit. And church, when trouble comes, and I haven't done anything to make it come, i got to stand up and stand my ground. I'm going to have to take courage and face this thing and not be afraid of it. But I'm going to have to absolutely refuse to quit until I see the justice and the answer of God in my life because it could take more time than I want. And if Satan can wear me down and get me to quit and get me to leave and get me to just vacate, then I become a pawn and I don't become the player. I become a piece on the chessboard instead of being the game itself. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So David, verse 14, they buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin. David got the bones and dug them up. He took the bones of Saul and Jonathan, and they took those men down off of those crosses, and they gave them honorable burials. It says they buried them in the country of Benjamin and Zelah. All of them, they were all related. It was Saul's house in the tomb of Kish, their father. So they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God heeded the prayer for the land. That rain did not come until justice was served. Honor was given. Closure was brought. The sin was atoned for. And they could move on. So what's the point? Trouble's going to come at us. Things are going to happen. My mom and dad, still alive. They were the generation born and fought the Great War. My dad was in World War II. They didn't ask for it. But they stood up and they went and they fought a world war. There's people born right now in nations that are under siege. Christians. Egyptian Christians. Christians and Muslim nations right now under siege and, and under tremendous intimidation and persecution. They didn't ask to be born there. They're just there. Trouble's going to come. Trouble's going to come to you and trouble's going to come to me. In the world you will have trouble, but be of good cheer. Jesus said, because I have overcome the world. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. If God be for me, who can be against me? And let me just read this last verse to you. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 35, I'm going to quit with this. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Therefore, church of the living God, do not cast away your confidence. Yeah, we're living in a secular world. Yes, we're living in a world gone crazy. Yes, we're living in uncertain times. Yes, you and I are in a nation right now that's in more turmoil. Australia dodged that bullet. They call it the global financial crisis. It really hasn't hit them yet. Their unemployment's 5.1. But you know what? Ours is 8-something. You know what that means? That means that there's 90% of the people working. 
And if we look at the bad and not the good, we'll become victims instead of standing up and saying, wait a minute, things aren't as bad as they seem. I have to stand on this rock. I'm going to have to ward off the, the birds of prey, the demonic. Okay. But God says, if he's with me, how can I? I'm not alone. God before me, who can be against me? I can stay on this rock. He says that he gives me courage. He gives me strength. He gives me boldness. They prayed and God sent the Holy Spirit and with great boldness the place was shaken. That's why we had a demonstration here of the Holy Spirit. We don't do this on our own, but we've got God the Holy Spirit with us. If God is for us, who can be against us? What have I got to be afraid of? Finances, when I've got the kingdom of God at my beck and call. Am I going to limit God because my world says we're broke? How foolish is that? That's just flesh and blood. I live in a world of the impossible where God says what is impossible with man is possible with God. <laughs> what am I looking at and what am I doing? Rizpa had the guts to stay. She had the guts to do what was hard to do, impossible to do. And she had the guts not to quit until her boys were buried. Church, God says, Stand up and stay put. Be who you are. Take courage. Don't you let fear overcome you like Billy Graham says. Christians, look up. The angels are closer and they're nearer than you think. Heaven's right there to give you every help and aid. But if it doesn't come when you think, don't you quit. Don't you stop. Don't you give up. Don't you pass out. Don't you lay down. Don't you give up and resign and say, well, it is what it is. I guess this is how it's going to be. No, it's not how it's going to be. Those boys are going to get buried. Mine's going to be in the word of God. My life will be eternal. She didn't know that she was going to be preached about in the 21st century. Nobody knew Rizpah, but we know Rizpah. Do you hear what I'm saying? You don't know what God has planned for your life. It may look like it's over. It may look like it's dead. It may look like there is nothing going for you. But you don't know what's coming. You don't know the generations that are going to be affected because you were courageous. You stood up. You stayed in your spot. And you didn't quit. I can't choose what comes to me. But I can choose how I respond pawn or player, the choice is mine. God says, choose life. God is for us. And if God be for us, church, who can be against us? But I have to ask you, if you were to walk out those doors tonight through no fault of your own, you were to die. Oh my gosh, die? Yeah, life is fragile. Life is so fragile. We are so incapable of keeping ourselves alive and if tonight was your last night on the planet and you died where would you open your eyes would you open your eyes in heaven or would you open your eyes in hell if you say well gee I don't know I'm not even sure I believe in hell well that's convenient but just because we don't believe in something doesn't mean it's not real they didn't believe in radio waves or microwaves or the technology that's floating, all the zeros and the ones that are floating all around us right now because we can't see it, but it's real. Just because we don't believe in hell doesn't mean hell isn't real. It's very real. Maybe you said, well, I, I hope I'd go to heaven, but God didn't say, gosh, you can hope your way into heaven. Hopers, the best hopers aren't going to heaven. God didn't say you hope your way into heaven. Well, maybe you're saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm good. I'm a good person. I'm an American. Gosh, good people go to heaven. But God didn't say good people go to heaven. God didn't say behavior will get you into heaven. And behavior modification, all the hard things you've tried to stop in your life. Well, because you're trying, you're going to heaven. God never said that. God said that our goodness, what we think is good, is like a filthy rag to him. Because if we compare ourselves with each other, we look pretty good. Maybe. Maybe not so. But he says, it's not the comparison. I, your goodness has to match up to mine. And there's no way, there's no way you can do that. You can't think your way into heaven. You can't hope your way into heaven. You can't behave your, behave your way into heaven. God says there's only one way to heaven. It's his way. He said you must be born again. You must be born again. Now in this nation, 
In this secular world that we live in, Christianity has been mocked, derided. Born again, people are looked upon as fanatics, it's foaming at the mouth, crazy people. But you see, it doesn't matter what people say. It matters what God says, and God says you must be born again. The way into God's heaven is not my way or your way. It's his way, and there's only one way, and he said you must be born again. Jesus explained that very clearly to a man named Nicodemus one dark Jerusalem night when Nicodemus, who was a celebrity rabbi in Jerusalem, came to Jesus and said, how do I get to heaven? And Jesus said, Nicodemus, you got to be born again. Nicodemus didn't know what that meant, and Jesus said, Nicodemus, what is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. You've got to be born again. Your spirit is disconnected from God by something called sin. Nicodemus, I'm going to a cross. If you'll look at that cross and you'll believe that I am who I said I am. If you'll let me be Savior and Lord. Savior and Lord. Lord means boss. You'll be born again and I'll take you out of the kingdom of darkness and I'll bring you back to the Father. That's why Jesus died. God knew we couldn't get to him, so he came to us. He's already done all he's going to do. He's a gentleman. He doesn't force his way into our lives. We have to receive the gift of salvation. It's not something we think. It's not something we hope. It's not something we behave. It's something we receive. And it's not something that we receive in our heads. Oh, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Americans will say that. Well, so does the devil, but the devil's not going to heaven. It's not about this little magic prayer that you pray or what you think in your head. It's about what you've done in your heart. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always been the same. God's asking for all of our heart and all of our lives, surrendering our lives to him, letting him be Savior and Lord. And if you've never looked at that cross, if you've never finally settled it, that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, he's all God and he became man for you and I, that no man took his life, he laid it down and he picked it back up. He is the ever-living, resurrected Lord of glory. He didn't stay on that cross, he was raised from the dead. And the sin of my life and the sin of your life, the sin of the ages was laid upon him and he took it on himself. And I can be forgiven, but I can only be forgiven if I'll surrender and believe and let him have my life. If you've never let him have all of your heart and all of your life, no matter how much you try, how much you hope, you're not going to heaven. And God didn't send you here tonight to send you to hell. He didn't make you for hell. He made you for heaven. That's why he came for you. He loved you so much he couldn't live without you. And if you've never surrendered your heart and your life to him tonight, he's asking you, will you open your life and open your heart and let me be your Savior and your Lord? Now all over this auditorium, if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. And I'm going to ask that everyone sit down and not leave. Because the Holy Spirit right now is talking to hearts. If you've never surrendered all of your heart and your life to Jesus Christ, I'm talking to you. If you serve God, but you've walked away from God and you've backslidden. You've been in, you've been out, you've been up, you've been down. You're really not serious about God, but tonight you're here. And you know that you need to get serious about God. I am talking to you. With heads up and eyes open all over this auditorium, I'm just going to count to three, and I'm going to ask us together, if you want to get right with God, that you raise your hand. You know what, The Rock? We don't close our eyes and bow our heads because we believe that if you can't say yes to Jesus in this safe place, how can you walk out those doors in a hostile environment, in a world that mocks God, and live for Jesus Christ? Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. He's not called us to be cowards. He's called us to be sons and daughters. So you don't need to be ashamed or embarrassed. We all came to Jesus the same way. Don't let one moment of shyness or embarrassment stop you from being what God's asked you to be and told you and is inviting you to become, which is a child of God. So if you've been running from him instead of to him, I'm talking to you. If you've messed up, man, maybe you're thinking, oh, I just don't trust myself. I say yes, and then I'm in and I'm out. Well, tonight's your night because you can't save yourself, but he can save you. And if you'll surrender your life, he'll change it. And I'm a living testimony of that. All over this auditorium, let's get right with God tonight. I'm just going to count to three. Go bang like that. Just raise your hands. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. I see that hand. 
I see that. Raise them high. Don't put them down. Let me see them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Come on, get your hands up. You know, you know the Holy Spirit, 16, 17. Who else needs to get right with God tonight? 18, 19. I see that hand. I can't see past anymore because I'd have to put my glasses on, but I counted 19. I know there's more of you, but this is what we're going to do. We're going to stand up. Grab what you brought to church with you and grab a friend if they brought you to church. As we sing this song, slip out of the aisles. Meet me at this altar. Let's get right with God. Let's change destinies tonight. And if you didn't raise your hand, it is not too late. God's calling you home. He loves you. He is not mad at you, but he needs you to receive what he wants to give you. Come quickly. Come quickly. Come quickly. Don't meander down those aisles. Run down here. Let's get right with God. Let's let God sweep this valley, sweep this city. Breathe on this place. Change our world with the breath of God and the love of God and the power of God. Come on quickly. Come on quickly. Quickly come. They're still coming. They're still coming. Quickly come. Quickly come. Quickly come. There's time. We'll make room at the fountain. We'll make room at the wells of salvation. There is room for everyone. You are not too bad for God. This is what we're going to do. We're going to take you into a very weird and scary place. And we're going to just froth all over you. No, what we're going to do is pray. When I stood in front of a pastor and I married my husband, I said these vows and I got a ring on my finger and my name was changed and my life was changed forever because God listens and hears our heart. And you need to smile because you're not going to a funeral, you're actually getting life. What a thought. He is so amazing. This is Pastor Dave. We're just gonna pray with you in a private place. And we're gonna tell you about a program that we have here called Spiritual Personal Trainers. Because when you get saved, you gotta learn how to live the life. It's brand new, I had babies, I didn't leave them in the hospital, I took them home and fed them and loved them. You're gonna be a brand new believer. And this church wants to love you, encourage you, teach you, walk with you. And we have a friend, if you want a friend, for five weeks, for 15 minutes before a service, we're gonna teach you five things. We say if you'll give us a year, God will change your life. Took you a while to get the mess you're in. Give God a chance. So this is Pastor Dave. If you'll just make a turn this way, I don't know if that's right or left. And it's not weird and crazy. Come on, guys, let's pray. We're going to go pray with you. Your friends can meet you there or they can go with you. Awesome. Awesome.